All right, so it's about 11 o'clock and we're going to just go ahead and start the session. The session is being recorded and will be available later because everybody is in different time zones. So you can continue to ask questions. Um, this allyship session is a two part program. It comes with an allyship crash course that you can find on YouTube. The link has been added to the chat for your convenience, but you'll also find it on the website and in your email. And in addition, I have a Google forum that will allow you to ask questions um, either after the session or during the session. If you would like, the question and answer area of Zoom is also open. You can ask a question or upload a question there. The general chat is for comments, but is not going to be for questions. So please keep your questions to the Q&A. Um, if the SV is here, they might be able to help you by telling people who put questions in the chat to move it to the Q&A. Um, otherwise, I would love to go ahead and start the session. And it is my honor to, to present these panelists who are really leaders in equity. And I really find that I think all of them are really valuable contributors to our Kai culture. So I hope that you guys will uh, be excited to welcome us with us today. And in no particular order, uh, the, the panels that I have here uh, are Michael Mueller. He is from IBM Research, and he's also a Safe Thai Cares representative. He is um, one of the people who will be uh, here around the conference too, if you do want to talk about Safe Thai Cares, which is an initiative that I'm sure we'll talk about in this session. Um, over, uh, so sorry, Michael, can you unpause and say? I'm sorry, can I what? Unpause and say hi, just so that everyone oh. knows. Hello, it's talking. me. I'm the old white guy in the group. <laughs> You're very humble. Um, so I'm also happy to introduce Helena Mentis. So Helena is actually um, Sikai president, Sikai CARES representative, and an associate professor of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Helena, will you say hi? Hi, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. And I just also want to just say, if I don't get a chance, thank you, Rena, for everything you do. And thank you for putting this together. I think we all like really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you all being here. Um, so the next person is Rita Oti. Rita is from University of Dalhousie. She's a Canada Research Chair, Associate Professor of Computer Science and STEM diversity and Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Irina and the organizers for putting this together. Rita will have to leave a bit early. So if you have questions for Rita, please take advantage of the Google form or social media to ask questions in case you don't get it in on time. All right, and I will also introduce Vinoba Binyamurthy. I hope I got that right. Sorry, and pronunciation is not my forte. Um, he is Project Research and Design Engineer for BBC Research and Development UK. She is also AC for Equity and SIGCAI Executive. Later on, oh, sorry, please stand. Okay. I cannot say hello if you want. Hi. <laughs> oh, we definitely want to hear your voice. Um, later on, we'll be joined by Shaowen Bartzal, hopefully. Uh, given that there is some um, conflicts in the paper organization. So if you have questions specifically for Xiaowen, again, there's the Google Drive or you'll catch her later in the session. Xiaowen is a professor, chair of Sikai Cares, VP, Sikai Executive Committee, and from Pennsylvania State University. So I wanted to also introduce myself. I forgot to do so. Thank you so much, Helena, for pointing that out. My name is Rena Webby. I'm the um, Globalization, Diversity and Inclusion Allyship Chair for this year and next. So I really hope to collect your feedback. Um, and I'm really happy to be moderating today's panel. So to start, I was hoping we could go around and ask, what does allyship mean to each of these panelists? And why do they feel it's important to be on this panel? So Michael, would you care to start something? Oh no, the old white guy talks first. This is bad. Um, <clears throat> allyship, 
for me, it is um, standing with friends, but also standing with people who aren't necessarily friends yet, standing with strangers, um, looking for justice, looking, looking to support people in their struggles. Sometimes there are struggles too. I try to make all of them in a sense my struggle, even though I know I'm not as personally affected as people who are not old white guys. Um, that doesn't mean I'm unmoved. It doesn't mean that I don't have membership in other people who don't look like me, who face different societally imposed challenges. So for me, allyship is, is um, it starts with that kind of solidarity and then it expands in whatever direction it needs to. And that is not for me to say, it is for us to say the person, the people with whom I am an ally. I am not a leadership, I'm not in a leader role, I'm in a supporter role as an ally. I'll have more to say, but that's already too much, so I'm done. Thank you, Michael. Um, Vinova, would you like to go next? Um, sure. Um, I think allyship is about building communities, building communities and across, um, or rather building trust and consistency and um, equality as opposed to through the community, especially uh, through marginalized group or traditionally marginalized group in that particular sector. Um, why it is important to me, I suppose for a very personal and selfish reason, I've got kids and I don't want them to be fighting the fights that um, I fight. Thank you. Um, Rita, would you like to take this question? What does allyship shifting to you? Or why is it important? For me, allyship is actually trying to make sure that everyone is included, trying to foster the cause of inclusion. And uh, I've been a very strong advocate of intersectionality with respect to looking at it, the in inclusion aspect. So looking at me, it's obvious I'm a, I'm a minority in a STEM. However, beyond being that, I do believe there are experiences I don't know, that of people of other culture, other sexual orientation, and uh, with different abilities, right? So it's not just trying to stand with minorities, actually trying to identify with them, put yourself in their shoes. Me as a minority, as a black minority, there are people that also struggle as I do, or even more than I do, that I can try to support their cause, make sure that their voices are heard. And I do think that it is important because that is one of the ways that we can advance the career because when the voices in the rooms, everybody in the room is equally represented, can contribute their own knowledge, that's one way to advance. So that's why I feel like this is an important topic as opposed to having only a few people contributing to what is happening. Why don't we provide opportunity for everybody in the room to be represented? Thank you. Uh, Helena, would you like to also answer this question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, the way that I look at allyship is that um, it's an opportunity for people to come together and combine their their power, their resources um, together towards some type of mutual benefit. And when I think about Sikai as a community, um, allowing all of us to learn how to be the best allies we can be and to uh, uh, combine our resources towards uh, the mutual benefit for Sakai in our community. Um, that's why we all need to be thinking about what it means to be an ally and how to be one and how to come together and how this is really not about any single one person, but it's about our community. Um, and I liked also when um, Michael was saying that it's, it's not so much about a leadership top-down um, situation, it's really about bottom-up. Um, so I think everybody who comes to this panel, who looks at your YouTube curated playlist, who's trying to learn because we all have the opportunity to continue to learn and continue to figure out how can we um, combine our strengths together. Thank you so much. So already we have some really great answers. Allyship not being about leadership, but being about being that support role. So I really hope that, you know, as you guys learn more about allyship here and through the YouTube playlist, you'll have questions and feel free to add them into the Q&A. Um, I'm going to move over to the next question I have. 
one thing that I hear a lot is people don't understand what is equity? What is equality? Is it pie? Do I give people my pie and have less pie for me? Or can people still be part of the conversation and everyone has pie? Um, so I would love to hear again about what you guys think about this. What, how do you explain these concepts to people? And I want to go in a different order every time. So uh, if possible, Vinoba, would you like to start? Um, equity and equality are sort of tied, I suppose. Equality I see has more of an ideal state, I suppose, that you get at uh, a point later in, well, once we get down to our destination, if we ever get there. Uh, equity, on the other hand, is about giving the type of support specific to an individual within the community. So what I need as an individual doesn't necessarily mean um, someone else needs the same kind of support. And it's identifying that piece of support that needs to be given and then giving it to them. And the easiest way I can think of doing it is not in pie, mostly because I hate pie, uh, but it's in terms of being, I know, I'm sorry. Uh, it's in terms of being uh, parents say, you have two, three children, you love them all, but obviously they're all different and you need to give them different things in order to get them to their ideal state in life. You want them all to succeed and be happy in the community, but you as a parent know that you don't essentially give them the same box of tools and expect them to get to a state that uh, will keep them happy. And they, they need that different piece of support. It doesn't mean that they're getting a different slice of the pie or an unequal slice of the pie. It just means that you're identifying the right effective tool to give them in order to get to a fair state in the community. Maybe I like key lime pie. That's adorable. Um, Rita, would you like to follow up on this question, equity versus equality, pie or not? Yeah, I, I re-echo the uh, Vanu uh, Bose uh, opinion on that. I do think that equality is about treating everyone the same, trying to just feel like people are basically going to need the same thing and providing the same resources to everyone irrespective of what they need to do, how they need to do it, and the hurdles they need to cross to be able to do that. We just assume that everybody's just gonna get every, the same thing. But, you know, I tend to see it this way. Nature hasn't actually made it like that. We're not made, made to have the same opportunity. We didn't grow up in the same environment. We don't have the same ability. So if uh, I, I grew up in a very large family where I, that made me really appreciate this. Uh, a notion of equity versus equality, right? Growing up with uh, my eight uh, sisters and brothers, uh, gender balanced, it, fe it feels like I can basically see everybody's strengths and everybody's weaknesses. So we're all amazing, but people are amazing, are uh, differently talented. And what we actually do that actually made me feel like if we actually harness this notion of uh, equity is going to advance us more than every, everything else is that we focus on each person's strengths and try to amplify it, providing the resources that make them succeed in their strengths while covering their weaknesses. So in that case, that's actually what my parents did. That doesn't actually mean that they hated some of us or liked some of us more. It just means that they realized the strengths that each of us welded and then tried to amplify us and push us along the line of our strength. So what happened is that all of us succeeded at the end of the day, but on different things. So when I talk about, uh, when I look at equity as in having to do with providing people the support they need to be able to do the job they have to do, it makes a lot of sense to me, you know, because there are so many practicality to it in our day-to-day -day life, in our workplaces. And when it comes to workplace, what does it translate to? It translates to realizing that some people enjoy some privileges that others do not, right? And providing them resources along that line. It also entails appreciating the fact that some people take extra load, do extra work that are probably unaccounted for. Right, think about, if I use myself as an example, being a, a female faculty, I can't tell you the number of work that we do in it. There may be 40% of my work as something that are not accounted for by what I'm supposed to be doing, but they are part of it. Ranging from a student needing help with personal life to family problem, 
to other things that they have to come to you to just things that are random that makes you a human being you have to attend to right i cannot say no to those things because those are part of the package that makes me a human as opposed to just being a professor but those things do not count as who i am i can't even count the number of committees that we have to serve as just as a because a, a minority has to be there for it to happen so this is not part of what i'm meant to be doing as a person right but uh, does the system actually appreciate this? Has the system, the performance measures been designed to accommodate for all these other things that I do or that the minorities do, other people do, that are actually making the system to work well, but are not accounted for? For me, I feel that equity is actually trying to accommodate those things that every other person do, as opposed to things that a segment of the population or of the community do. Those are the things that every other person is measured on. I also feel like equity also has to do that. Some people have to cross extra hurdles to get to where they are, right? Think about it. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't think that a really race actually captures this, but think about a race. Everybody starts at a starting point and then goes. It assumes that everybody starts at a point and then the race starts, everybody proceeds. But some people have to start way back before the starting point. And when the race starts, before they get to the starting point, others are already get, have already gotten to their finishing point. But we still rate them, not based on the distance they have covered to get to where they are, but whether they have been able to get there. So get to the final point. So I do think that equity also entails appreciating those hurdles, the extra miles, the extra work some people have to do because of not their own making, but because of where nature placed them actually. So appreciating those things makes a lot of it would actually be the equity we're talking about. Are this, how does this apply in workplaces, in admissions and a lot of things? I basically argue for it because I'm a, I'm a benefit of that actually. When I tell people I got, I got admission to study computer science in the university without actually having used a computer at all. So at times when I argue for this, I kind of say that I would have been out of this. I wouldn't have been in this career. Has it been that the system said, everybody needs to have known how to write codes, be an expert in computer and this and that before being admitted. It's not like I preferred not to know how to use computer before, but I didn't have that opportunity to do that. But the system was flexible enough to let me in. And then eventually, I still grew up to be the best graduate student. But what I might say, that's not the story. The story is that the equity actually trying to look at those hindrances, those limitations that people have to cross to get to where they are. And eventually, it comes out that everybody in the house is supported without marginalizing any of the group. But along the line, they need help. Uh, someone who is, a, uh, who is blind needs a visual aid. Another person who is deaf need a hearing aid. It's wrong to distribute visual aid to everybody and I assume that that is, that is what equality does. Thanks. I'd like to add to this. Um, so I grew up in Nigeria and I also never coded before I came into my degree, Information Systems Engineering at University of uh, Surrey. Um, I had maybe written a couple of essays on word maybe i used to paint loved paint was incredibly sad it was going to go away at one point uh thankfully it didn't but what rita says is is important i think because you know especially if you just take that particular dimension of you know you need to code you need to do this in order to become a computer scientist back in the day uh <laughs> when i went in I was given the chance not to, and I still got into a job that, you know, builds uh, things of technology and computers. And I, I do worry that the competition um, to get into that university, to get into that job is becoming more and more that these opportunities and these uh, sort of, um, yeah, this opportunity to let people who might not have what you might traditionally think of as the skills needed for the job are not going to be let in because we have somehow managed to design our needs to such a narrow focus that we don't give a chance to people who might bring that something extra in there, even though they don't have that, you know, what, what you might traditionally call the core skills, so to speak. As an interdisciplinary person as well, with a background in psychology and my master's and PhD, computer science, these, what you guys said really speaks to me. And I hope that as well, um, that we can see every, like many examples from all around Kai of 
how multi and interdisciplinary studies really does help us and how that contributes because of like the initiatives that we have bringing people into our fields and being flexible. But just to really hit the nail on the head here, what can we say about allyship and our current Sakai community? What are some examples that maybe really would solidify this con this concept for people who are attending this conference? How does allyship help us here? So, um, of course, anyone can jump in. Um, would you like to start, Helena? Well, when I think about the conference, I think about the types of um, uh, talks we have and in, in, in just the 20 years that, almost 20 years that I've been coming to, uh, no, it has been, oh crap, um, <laughs> the Kai conference, just realized that. Um, I, I've definitely seen like um, an expansion of the types of work, not a movement, an expansion. And um, I just really loved what Rita said. Uh, I'll just, just say ditto um, for so much of it. But um, one of the things that I feel was an important word was value, value the variety and to see a different um, sense of what success looks like and what, and what we might wanna value. And so I think that has always been <clears throat> a key reason as to why SIGCHI as a community has grown so big and has always had sort of this ethos of, uh, if it's about people, come be a part of us. We accept you and your contribution. And I'm not saying it hasn't been without tension along the way. We've all gotten a review that said, this is not HCI or something. And you know, then you go and you scream into the void. But, um, but overall, the ethos has always been to be, um, to be open and to say, well, this is new and that's okay. This is a different way of looking at the problem space and that's okay. And, and maybe that's taking our field faster and further. So I would say from the point of allyship, constantly having those conversations about um, how can we expand our values? How can we see this as a different type of success, but equally as important? Um, if you think about the idea behind, um, behind quick, uh, equity as always rising people to the same level. So everybody's at the same level. That makes an assumption that there is a right level and I really have been trying to fight that perspective for a number of years now that we don't always have to be the same cookie cutter version of one another, that we can keep expanding. What does it look like to be an HCI practitioner researcher? What does it look like to be a scientist? What does it look like? How, do, how does one um, do research in X area and how that um, can be done from many, many different perspectives? So I think those conversations is exactly what allyship is about, is being able to see that, um, that somebody is not deficient because they've never coded before, let's use that as the example, but rather they come at it from a different perspective and, and where they're going to end up is different too. And that comes down to us also being more open and taking it back to our universities to say that um, what looks like success in SIGCHI and HCI is quite varied and we need to be accepting of all of those um, various endpoints. It's not the same endpoint, we should not be running all the same race. I would want to jump in at this point, uh, if that is okay. Okay, I, I do think that allyship uh, uh, with respect to SIGCHI uh, in addition also uh, has to do that everybody is actually welcome. SIGCHI has been uh, one of the uh, most diverse community I've ever been to. Uh, however, uh, it's also important to highlight that it's not a community for people who are already developed in their research, but it's also a community for people who are just at the beginning stage of their research who would wanna grow and become experts. But this is, very, this is very important because at times it's time to say, oh, this is not where you start. This is where you come to when you probably become a, an, an expert researcher, a distinguished researcher of the world caliber and stuff like that. And I also think that Sika is meant for people that speak every language, irrespective of the accent. I've had occasion where also someone got so intimidated as an, instead of sending out the person who is this first author of the paper because it's not a native speaker, if it appears like uh, sending someone who's a native speaker to present, it might get more 
attention to the work or stuff like that. But I, do, I don't think that that is what Sikai should represent. I do think that it represents people of all accents and languages where people can actually get their work presented and get trained. For me, I tend to see it, like I told my student, it's an opportunity to learn and grow. The way you get to do it, you get better. I remember my first presentation at Sikai, how it was terrifying and everything, but it got better, right? If you don't get that opportunity to start doing it and get it perfect in it, you will never get perfect. It's always gonna continue like that. So making this known that this is meant for people of all language, all stages of develop development in terms of your research, it's also very, very important to me. And that is all about the allyship, acknowledging that people at different stages require different help and would we'll get it within Sikai and are welcome at any stage irrespective of whatever they feel they are feeling, they're gonna be supported. I, I remember feeling after presenting my work, oh, it's not as bad as I thought. So when people came to me and said, oh, that was amazing. Yeah, I started asking me questions. I mean, I was still a bit terrified, but I felt at home. The second time was much easier. I already feel like, oh, the community is not gonna swallow me. People kind, kind of as friendly and stuff like that. So for people joining you, creating that kind of atmosphere of welcoming and the, it actually makes, actually makes a lot of difference. It actually remains, it, it, it sticks in your mind as you grow. You feel like, oh, this was at the point that that major change happened. I learned a lot from here and that was where I began to grow. So that opportunity is one thing I like about Sikai and at uh, the allyship program, associating with these different people and different stages is very important. Yeah, if I may, I, healthy community. Oh, there's an echo. Um, healthy communities have a way of bringing more people into membership. And, and there's not a single path into membership, of course, but um, we, can, we can say, oh, well, you have to be good at something before you get to talk at Kai. And that's a way of limiting our membership, or we can find ways in. And sometimes those ways in, in involve mentoring, and sometimes they involve advocacy that not not Michael wants to be in, but Michael wants a group of people who aren't in yet to be in. And, um, and I think if we think about Kai as sort of a great big sprawling community of practice, we know that the communities of practice have, have well-developed pathways for people to enter. Uh, some of you've read the legitimate peripheral participation. So you enter and you watch for a little while and then you try some things. And then well, what happens when you try some things this is, I think, where allyship ceases being just equality and becomes a kind of an equity advocacy. If you try some things, then people should be gentle, kind, open, because they're going to learn from you because you're different. And we may occasionally, as allies, need to make sure that that welcome is there and that the tone of the welcome is, is an inviting tone. Um, and I think... Um, to the previous question, I, I think of equity as being a very active form maybe of allyship, but maybe it's the next step after allyship um, in which we say, there are obstacles that have been placed in front of some of us, but not all of us. I'm echoing some of the people who just spoke. Um, and we need to remove those obstacles where we can or work with people on ways around them, over them, under them, through them. Uh, that's the active part of allyship. We actually have a great example, you know, tell me if I'm wrong on this, by the way, <laughs> but um, we had to put together our, our Sikai town hall videos. And one of our EC members just made the offhanded comment to her, uh, her partner in crime. Uh, this would be a lot easier to do, to do these recordings in, you know, my native language. And this is allyship. Her partner said, well, then why don't you? They're recorded, they're being transcribed and put, you know, and put with subtitles, like, why not? Yeah. And like, that's allyship, is to it hear is. the unspoken needs sometimes and recognizing that we are in a space to do that right now. And that, that was amazing when I saw that. I was like, why didn't I think of saying that? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, my mind was blown as well. And so if, if you go to the town hall uh, set of videos on Delegate Connect, you will see that the uh, ACs for accessibility, Stacy and Soraya, 
have a combined video and Stacy's part is in English and Soraya's part is in Portuguese and Soraya's part is transcribed in English so you understand what she's saying and it's absolutely musical um, so definitely go and give that a watch. So these are all wonderful examples about how being an ally, being an advocate for equity really does enrich our community. And I have this question actually come up from the Google form and oh, welcome Chawan. Chawan just joined us. Welcome Chawan. So we're just uh, Sorry, I'm late because I'm in a, a lot. And anyway, my paper is presented. So sorry about that. So don't worry about being late. There's a ton of questions. The one I was about to ask that relates a little bit to what we were talking about comes from uh, the Google Forms. So once again, advertising for you guys to check out the Google Form and put in your questions. So Anna Offwinger asks, I was part of a group that wanted to provide students in our lab and department with anti-discrimination support in the wake of hashtag shutdown STEM. Uh, for those of you who don't know, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. We struggled with coming up with practical things we can do to engage students. It was hard to know what would actually be helpful. Do you have any practical suggestions? So I know we just talked about one, allowing people to present in a language that they're most comfortable with, but what are some other practical things we can do? And remember the YouTube channel also has uh, some videos on how to be an allyship in your everyday. Um, Taiwan, would you like to jump right in and, and talk about some practical ways that you can be helpful, you can be an ally? And of course, Taiwan, as well as I mentioned before, is one of the Sikai CARES members. Uh, and actually, there's a lot of Sikai CARE members here at CHI. So I would also wouldn't mind if you threw in a little bit about Sikai CARES. Thing. And then Michael, as well, part of Sikai CARES. And, Actually, most of us are. <laughs> we can jump in as we see this. <laughs> yeah, and can somebody else um, get, get this started? I'm still trying to kind of find my way around the questions and all that. Sorry about this. Just got in okay. here. Do you want um, me to do a quick Sikai Cares sure. plug? Or do you want me to answer the question first? Um, let's do a quick Sikai Cares plug and then come back to practical suggestions on how to be in a morning. So uh, CARES, which I actually don't remember now what it actually stands for. Uh, it's, it's like on the website, it actually stands for something. Um, is uh, something that actually a lot of the SIGs, uh, so SIG Graph, for instance, SIG Doc, there are other SIGs, it's not just SIG Chi that are part of ECM, has started to put together um, CARES groups, which are there to support the members of that SIG for any type of harassment, um, bias, discrimination issue that they're facing at, um, at and around ACM events. This is part of a larger initiative that the ACM is doing. There's multiple levels of this, but CARES was just one concept to have a, a group of folks who are really focused on this for the SIG and for the SIG's conferences. Um, so uh, when Shawan uh, Barzell joined uh, SIG High and with her um, at, the, at the SIG High EC level and with her uh, history of uh, feminism and HCI and just her knowledge and understanding of, um, of some of the um, issues around harassment and, and discrimination we've had at conferences, um, when she said, I'd love to set up a CARES, I said, please. So that's my setup for Shawan, and um, maybe she can take it on from there as to um, uh, the group that she's put together. And thank you very much, Helena, for getting this started. Uh, I just want to kind of actually give credit to where credit is due. Um, the Formation of Care is actually a group effort. And if you look at the Sikai Care's website, we have just a very diverse um, individuals with a lot of different expertise. They also have had uh, years of experiences and com community service behind them. And I think um, I, I will say that um, trying to address 
discrimination and harassment issues is not something very easy to do at all. Um, so I'm very glad that we have this um, committee um, formed. And a lot of times we are uh, each other's best allies. We kind of bounce um, uh, ideas and um, of each other. And um, we really, I think the goal here, just like what Helena said, we're trying to be there um, for people who are affected by these negative experiences. And I think we still, um, this is a really early, this just got started in um, January of last year. And we very much would like to work with everybody in the community to really solidify our effort and then try to um, be there as much as for our community. Thank you so much. Would anyone else like to comment on Sick Kai Cares? Okay, so you can find more information about Sick Kai Cares, and I will make sure that those links get updated on our online material and posted to um, Delegate Connect, which is a great time to also shout out to thank you for all of the people from Executive Events and Delegate Connect for helping us put everything together, and uh, to all our SVs who are really working hard behind the scenes. And I know SVN can be very invisible in person, so online. <laughs> but we really, I do want to shout out to them. And I'm also going to bring us back to the question that was asked. Uh, so how can we um, help support people at our university? So this question, again, I was part of a group that wanted to provide students with our lab group and department with anti-discrimination support in the wake of hashtag shutdown STEM. And we struggled with practical things we could do to engage students. And it was hard to know what would actually be helpful. So can we give some um, suggestions that might be more local to people or more, I guess, immediately usable? So um, one of the things that, that did come up already is allowing people to speak in their native language to providing accessibility based on needs and not just everybody has access to transcript. You know, it could be, um, also brought back to some of the examples that we were saying about um, being able and welcoming and inclusive of people, regardless of what language they originally speak and what accent they have, and really showing that we care and we want to be inclusive of the research. Um, but I know there's a ton of other suggestions out there. Would anyone like to jump in? Helena? So, um I wasn't really sure if the question was asking about like during shutdown STEM or just more generally anti-discrimination. Uh, um, one of the things that I do think is important is, um, is I, I learned a long time ago that uh, you don't put the work on the groups that are at the front lines of fighting the fight. So if you want to support somebody in your department or in your, your lab group, um, being the person that you make sure that um, you're educated as to what the issues are, um, and then you do the work to educate others. Um, so like, for instance, we did that a lot um, within our human center computing program. We had a couple of meetings, um, student led, um, but faculty involved where we did some of the readings, some of the really good stuff that's been coming out of HCI to talk about some of the issues. Um, we did like a, an exercise sort of where you, you see where your um, privilege, uh, how many buttons you have in your pile. Um, and then we talked about our feelings around that and creating that safe space, having those conversations and allowing people to come together and to learn from one another, but not putting that on those folks who really, you know, they're tired. They're not the ones who want to be having um, that, uh, having to motivate that conversation. So I think that's one thing you can always do as an ally is to not only make sure you're educated, but that you take the extra steps to help others understand as well. I'm gonna talk about an academic department and I'm not in one, but I think I have heard enough so that this might be useful. There are safe places to talk about things that are going wrong and then there are unsafe places. And the department is usually not a safe place, uh, unless you're senior faculty and then yeah, then a, a notion of equality makes it look like it's okay for you to speak if you're senior faculty. And if you're junior faculty or pre-tenure, oh, well, maybe that's a little bit different. And if you're a student, oh my goodness. And so making a safe place is one part of the story, but then who can carry the word from that safe place into the dangerous place? And, 
and and then the person who carries that, as Helena just said, uh, really need, has a burden of educating themselves to make sure they're carrying the word properly. But there's a, another way to think about this is a syndicalist sense. If there's a student union, well, then the representatives of the student union can say something, but there isn't always a student union, and those representatives may still be dooming themselves. So it's really hard. We, we think it, it, we say equality and we say freedom of speech and yeah, sure. But the consequences of exercising that freedom of speech are very, very different for people. And so, so part of allyship, part of advocacy is knowing when, when it's too dangerous for a subaltern, so to speak, to speak and when someone else should be carrying that message and taking whatever is gonna come, but it won't be as de desperately dangerous as it would be for a person with lower power. I just said the same thing three times, sorry. No, I but uh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, no, go ahead, Rita, I can, I can join up later. Okay, I just have a, a, a one or two sentences to add to that. You know, I do also think it's about we as a, a leadership of different labs or our faculty members actually getting to realize what implicit biases means. Um, recently, I, I had an experience that I am still trying to uh, see the best way to navigate through it. This is a student not from my faculty or from my university, but from another university had called me and uh, she should be in her late 50s. But after migrating to uh, the Western world, uh, she had to change career. So she took time and gave birth and eventually changed her career and started from undergrad. So uh, the age difference is there. And then the undergrad, one of the undergrad courses she was taking, they required them to do a group work in the group of five, five of which are young people of 18 and highest is 20 and Caucasians being the only black, that old enough. And despite the fact she's the leader of the group trying to motivate them like mother would motivate their kids to do the work, what happened was very interesting. After the group work, they would individually give each other marks and read stuff like that. But at the end of the day, the other four would go and change their marks they have given her and submit a lesser mark. So the, the grades came back and she was surprised. That wasn't what they agreed on. So the, what got me fascinated is that she reached out to the faculty, the professor in charge of this course. And the professor said, I will look into it. So apparently without consulting her or not putting her into the picture of what the procedures of looking into it is, um, it, what is going on. The next email was the professor reaching out to her said, the, the reducing of mark was done in good faith and the, the case is closed. So at the point she got to me, she was at the point of filling this class. I was like, is that what the professor said? He said, that was the professor. He said, oh, maybe I should quit the university. I don't think that this place have a, a space for me. I looked at her from the lens of my own self. I already see that there's a lot of things going on here. I'm not actually going to say that they are biased about her, but this is something I, I, I would assume that the professor would have followed up more, doing some open way and making it open what she has done. I probably called the whole group together to get to know what is happening. This is one of those things that we call implicit bias. Maybe I wouldn't say the professor is biased herself or himself or the student are biased, but treating things this way is actually a, a very bad signal. This is how many people are dropping out of STEM on a daily basis. Because of this type of treatment, people do not know what is the right way to handle certain sensitive issues, including the group works. Uh, in my class, I do not put a single female amidst all guys or put one black amidst all that these things have a way of playing back. But most people do not know it. And when you have problem, how do you handle it? She's dropping out of the school and this is one down and many people are bound to do stuff like that. So this not knowing what to do or how to handle sensitive issues is actually a major and a big part of what is going on. And I've also had occasions where people have actually argued, is this computer science enough? Uh, apparently it's, it's not that it's not computer science, it's just that the topic, for example, I have someone working on breastfeeding. She's a mother and then she passed through a lot of ordeals during her work. And she felt like, oh, I'm gonna, since I have this opportunity to do a work, let me do a work that is related that would serve me. And someone asked me, is this 
it still feels like doing a machine learning computer science related thing, but targeted on breastfeeding seems like, oh, it should justify how it's computer science. I said, there's no justification needed for this. How, why do I bring this topic up? It's actually knowing that what people are interested to work on is actually inspired by their experience. At the moment we learn to appreciate that, it actually goes a long way in advancing our field and our community. If it comes to Kai, do we have any some things that we think that are more Kai than others, some topic that should be more Kai than others? That basically means allowing me or depriving me from uh, trying to explore my lived experience and trying to contribute in an area that I'm passionate about and pushing me to an area that I have no interest in because I want to belong. I want to be seen as part of it. That is actually an utter bias. So these are the implicit uh, ways that people actually should get to know that this type of things exist. You might not know, you might not know that it's actually affecting people, but it does affect people in a lot of ways. I'm so sorry to hear that someone is leaving a university because of an equity issue, because I mean, it's really our loss as a community. And I know I know Vinoba wanted to speak before, uh, so I'm gonna invite her to speak now. Oh, you're okay. I was going to say there's no way I'm going to follow up on Rita after that. Um, we should we should move on. I think that's. Uh... <laughs> so um, I do want to ask one of the particularly hard questions, and I think uh, that kind of gives us a really good segue into it. Um, what is a blocker for allyship? So we know why allyship would help. It would get more people into our community. It would make sure that people are more inclusive, better flow of ideas. So what's stopping people from actively engaging and being an ally? I can take this one. So I think one of it is just fear and not knowing about other people's issues, not feeling like you can help if you don't have a lived experience as well, not knowing how to maybe so um, I know Helena was talking about how you don't put the education on the marginalized group. And I agree that is one of the things that we shouldn't be doing. But I also think that openness and communication and transparency of the issues, um, talking to people and finding out what issues are important to them uh, is a key part of trying to figure out how you can be an ally. Um, and so, you know, um, Recently, Neha Kumar, VP for Large, and a few of the people, including Stacey, Soraya, myself, uh, have been involved in uh, a set of equity talks, which is more about, uh, which is about, you know, having a roundtable conversation, talking to different people about, um, you know, uh, what it means, what our accessibility needs, what should we have there, um, what does globalization mean, what does gender mean, various issues that are all, you know, from, on different dimension and calling people with lived experiences to come and sort of talk about it and tell us about it. And this is actually where I met uh, Michael, for instance. Um, and so I think that openness and sense of uh, inviting people to come and have a conversation is important. And it also, we also do things like, for instance, having a recorded section of the um, talk. So you have one hour of recorded sections where people might want to maybe temper their opinions if they feel like they can't be open about it. And then we have like half an hour of uh, an unrecorded version where people can be a little bit more open and talk about things a little bit more uh, personally. And also we continue things on a, uh, the Discord channel. So having multiple ways of talking to people, having different communication channels for people, allowing and encouraging two-way communication, not just a um, you know, one-way um, download of information, I think, especially in this day and age, is very important for the community. And I hope uh, more like those security talks um, happen. So I think that's that's key, really, trying to learn and learn from people who've lived it. And I guess I'd like to say um, a lot of us non-minoritized people are pretty shy these days. We don't want to make a mistake. We then stand stand a bit back. And I I think there's more responsibility on us than that. I'll tell a very quick personal story. I'm trying not to do personal stories in this panel, but um, IBM decided that they would work on principles of racial equity and design. And the five black women who were leading this effort asked me to be an advisor. And I said, well, 
I'm an old white man, so I'm part of the problem we're trying to solve. And they said, yes, old white man, we know that. And I said, I will make mistakes. Is that okay? And they said, yes, we're anticipating it. And in the course of the next hour, I delivered. I made at least three really whopping mistakes. And they carried me through my failures. They were failures because I was going to be useful to them. And because maybe because they liked me, but certainly because I had a role to play. They were the leaders. I could... I had communication channels available to me into research that they didn't have, um, also into SIGCHI, frankly, that they didn't have. And so, so we could figure out how to do that even though, even though I didn't know what I was talking about some of the time. Didn't know what I was talking about some of the time, but I can learn. We can always learn from each other. So, th so um, there might be this blocker of, oh, I'll do it wrong, but then, Maybe, maybe it's time for some of us who've been in good, in solid, secure positions to get some things wrong. And learn from I, I'll probably add uh, one sentence to that. Uh, I do think that, uh, in my opinion, just like uh, Vena, <coughs> Vena Bo says, uh, and also Helena said, it's not about the leaders trying to come up with all the decisions, make all the decisions. They do not have the answers most times right engaging with the people the various community you want to support or you're supporting is very important and that's what it means to be allies for me it's not actually trying to impose what i think is going to work for the groups and then think that they, because you, you don't know what it feels to be in their shoes trying to be in their shoes and listen and you can't actually imagine it by only by involving them and getting to actually listen with the intention to learn that you can be an effective ally and beyond actually just trying to get more people to be allies actually trying to get more people to be genuinely involved is very important because these days i, I definitely feel that the quest for allyship and the diversity is actually um just ending up in a checklist where people talk about it and tick off the boxes and then that is it oh yeah they say we need more women let's hire them then put them there, there's no support to make them grow. They just become another bunch of just waste people's talents. And it's actually being generally involved, not only by talking about it, but doing actions and providing the environment that people need to succeed. So most times when I hear the leaders, people in higher positions talking about it, I just nod my head because I know that this is actually to fulfill political uh, agenda as opposed to really being more concerned about getting things done and when we get people that are genuinely involved listening to people that are involved trying to come up with solutions that would work things will begin to move it will it will it will not be a game of talking about it we are going to see actions happening solutions being provided at the time that people and when people and how people need it that's the intersectional lens to try to support people based on what they need not what you think they need. Thank you, Rita. Shawan, do you want to go next and then Helena? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was going to say you can let her go first. Um, thank you for all these very wonderful comments. I, I'm just curious, um, wondering, uh, wonder, I think one of the reasons that people are reluctant to come forward is it's not easy um, to relive a lot of these kind of live experiences. And um, um, Michael mentioned earlier about safe space. And while I think a lot of these kind of MA sessions or equity talks are wonderful, um, I, you know, it's still, um, it's, somebody will have to um, get the courage um, to actually share the experience. Even when you can actually, if you don't feel comfortable doing this um, publicly, you do it individually on the individual session, at the end of the day, it's what can we do about it, right? And I, I think this is, you know, once it's a sharing and then, you know, what can we do about it? There's still a lot to do be, to go from here to there. And I think we are making progress in the community in terms of trying to find solutions, but we're not completely there. And one thing I will also say that um, I would like to see more advocacy um, on all levels. I'm also involved with all, a lot of these equity talks and I can help in noticing that um, it's the usual suspects that are there. And I would like to see a lot more um, 
um, support uh, allow a, a, a broader reach, reach um, to our broader community, and then so that uh, we can collectively try to to do this, as opposed to only a, a few of us. Um, uh, not pointing um, fingers, but I really do think that that's what's actually needed and is necessary moving forward. So I'll just like continue. Um, so uh, when it there's a difference between um, when you are an ally without power versus when you are an ally with power. And one of the keys about being an ally with power is that um, you probably are <clears throat> more aware of how things actually work and how you get heard and what will get traction versus what won't get traction and what is the timeline to get things done. Um, one of the things that I usually end up, maybe there are many people who think I'm the blocker. Um, and the reason that I'm seen as the blocker is because I'm like, well, the thing that you say you need right now, I literally, I'm telling you it's not doable. Um, so there's many reasons for this. First of all, I don't, oftentimes I don't want to put people in a position where they're not going to be successful in that position. So that's like always number one. I don't want to ever harm somebody further by setting them up for failure. That's just not a great position to be in. So I'm always cognizant, cognizant of that. And thus sometimes like the thing that people say they want, I'm like, I don't think that's the best solution right now. And I'm, I'm just telling you from what I see from my vantage point. Usually I'm saying this from the state high president, but this has also happened in my role as associate dean of my College of Engineering and Information Technology right now, I see this happening. And so usually I say, well, let's talk about what's the outcome? When do we wanna to try to get to that outcome? And let's talk about pathways towards that outcome. And that's how I'm seeing myself sometimes as an ally is being able to take all that knowledge that I have and providing that pathway. Um, and sometimes I'm just like, this is not the fight. There are other fights. I don't think this is the fight right now because you're not going to get the traction you need. The person that you need to hear it is not gonna hear it. So that's the one thing that I think is really important is to understand like, what is the position of the ally that you're going to and to find um, those allies at all of those different levels because everybody has a different role in this um, in, in moving the needle. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is that there are, and this is why I think the Kai Cares is so important. There are usually, and more and more so, clear pathways to, to um, having your voice heard, to have your complaints heard, um, to get the justice that you're aiming for. Um, and being aware of what those are and how to go about them and the impact that they have is actually probably one of the most important things um, that will really get that, that needle moving. So um, I know, for instance, a lot of um, uh, people have been paying attention to this Turing Award situation. Um, uh, this has come up. And the one thing that I like to highlight for people is that there is now especially, but there has been for a while, um, a record of all complaints that have ever been made, um, whether or not it's through the ACM's harassment mechanism or um, uh, through COPE, which is professional ethics. And one of the key things that happen with that is that they do a search on all potential award winners. They do a search on their names and there was no hit for Ullman. For Professor Ullman. And, um, and that's a problem. If folks are not following the process, they're not submitting their complaints about people who are doing things that, you know, we're all whispering about them, but we're not submitting the formal complaints. If there's no formal complaint, then that formal can't complaint can't actually be adjudicated and go through the actual process to determine that there was discrimination, unethical behavior, harassment, whatever the outcome that you're looking for, um, the, 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 the reason for the complaint, and then um, appropriate sanctions or um, actions can be taken. You don't want somebody to just say, well, you know, Rena, she, she wrote a really bad review about me once, and I, I don't think she should ever be allowed to do it. You know, you don't want people saying that on Twitter about you because you're like, what are you talking about? We all know some people who have said something not nice about ourselves. Um, 
you want appropriate processes to be followed. And that's why I think we just need to recognize what those processes are. And every time we learn that there needs to be a better process, that we respond to that. So I think that's another thing that the ACM did. They realized that they need a better process um, to really highlight when there are issues with somebody. And, um, and that's why they put out that they're going to try to update the awards process to, to say, do we know anything? <laughs> Have a more diverse committee, et cetera. All the SIGs also signed on to that. And SIG Chi ourselves, we're thinking about how can we make our awards process better now that we've seen um, how there can be sometimes a slip through. But this is, I think, like one of those things that this is why I think allyship is again about the community to understand what do I need to do to be an ally? And it's not always just being like, I'm your friend, I'm gonna be there for you. But it's really thinking about what are the actions I can take? What are the challenges that are out there? And who do I need to use my voice with in as much of a respectful manner as possible? Of course, you know, you get hurt a little bit better that way. But that's, that's one of the things that I think about um, when I think about blockers. And I apologize if anybody's ever felt I'm a blocker. I'm not trying to be, but. <laughs> Elena, thank you so much for your service. And honestly, like I, I've always found that you've been helping me. Um, and I really want to, to take a moment to, to point out that a couple of resources are available on sickai.org slash resources slash sickai-cares. Um, so the link is in the chat. And I also wanted to kind of summarize. So we talked a little bit about why it's important to have allies and why not there's no need to like declare your membership in a group to be an ally. Allies are everybody. Really, I like to think of it as, and this might be just my like Middle Eastern background talking, as uh, being a good host. You know, if someone comes over to your house, you want them to feel included. You want them to have everything they need to be able to have a good conversation with you, right? You know, offer them a glass of water. And, you know, having that welcoming, inclusive attitude is, is kind of what I'm hearing here. Um, I got a really great question in Google Forms, and I, I want to ask it. Uh, so we talked about, you know, a little bit about the opposite of this. So Christine Bauer from Utrecht University asks, how can we ensure that we identify what someone or some group really needs instead of putting on people what we think that they need? Do you have best practices or good examples? So. I think this is a great question because we always talk about how being an ally is just being there to support someone, um, being there to amplify a voice or making sure that that person doesn't need to say, hey, there's no family resources here by themselves. Like, even if you don't have a family, you can advocate for family resources at Kai because you know people who are affected, people who you might want to talk to can benefit and therefore we all benefit as a community. But this question here I really liked because what if we're just giving them the wrong resources or identifying their resources wrong? How do we know? Um, and I would love to hear some of the answers to this question. Does anyone want to start? I could give it a try. I'd like to say we already know the answer to this question because until the Scandinavian participatory design movement came along, the way that we understood users' needs was somebody who probably looked like me in a white lab coat with a clipboard and a stopwatch went and watched people do things and then said, well, we'll find you a way to do it faster. That must be what you want. And the among the many sort of revolutionary things that happened in the early days of participatory design was the notion that the users, the workers, it was a workplace movement, the workers know the job better than the analysts do. At one point, Lucy Sutchman said, we're just going to have to acknowledge we don't have a clue. And the people who do the work know what's going on. And I would, I think it's the same lesson. So if we try to provide things for people whom we have not consulted with, uh, then we're back to that, then we're back to making mistakes. And, and we know how to do this because we've been doing it now for 30 years. And, and, and working directly with the people affected by policies, technologies, decisions, work practices, all that stuff. Um, we know how to do this. We know how to work with people. It's in our skills. We should just do that in this domain too. Sorry, he's complaining too much. Bye.
So that's a really great point. Like definitely we want to make sure that we're kind of approaching things as a team. I also see a question in the chat that I wanted to direct at Helena before we got too far from the ACM protocols. But Kosh asks, what is the process to make a formal complaint? Can you please talk about confidentiality about this process? This way allies can feel safe. Yeah, thank you, Vino, for correcting the fact that I don't know how to use the chat. Uh, <laughs> all right, I started I started adding a few. So um <laughs> So first of all, I just want to put a plug for carers, of course, one of the things that if you have just no idea where to start, always go straight to carers. One of the things that we like to do is to tell you our job is to know these processes and to give you the pathway to help you understand that pathway. Um, anonymity. So, um, for instance, for the I think it was the last one, you know, maybe the second to last one that I uh, posted, which was harassment, discrimination bias, um, that complaint process that goes through the ACM is the official process, you can submit a complaint anonymously. Um, and, uh, and all that does is it goes into a record for the future. Um, if they don't have a name for follow-up. There's no way to actually do an investigation. So then they're, this is just sort of for their information. Um, they do keep track of um, uh, these uh, complaints simply because there's usually a pattern for, for anybody um, who is, for instance, harassing um, folks at ECM conferences, for instance. Um, if you do submit your name with it, you will be uh, contacted within 24 hours just to let you know that they did receive your complaint. Uh, it goes to the, uh, the ACM lawyer who um, then will contact you. Um, there is actually a third party that has now been employed by the ACM to investigate all uh, concerns around harassment, uh, discrimination and bias. Um, and that is in, in order to ensure that you know everything is above board and that um, everybody is treated well. Um, we've seen um, our first uh, full cycle of this um, through CARES. It took about a year um, for the whole process to go through with investigation. Um, however, uh, it did end in sanctions for the person um, who was accused. And, um, and those sanctions are pretty severe. Uh, so uh, I can confidently say that there is a process, it does work, it does take time, um, but there is um, there are outcomes uh, of that process. I'm a little less familiar with the other two uh, processes, for instance, the publications um, concerns go through the ACM pubs board. I know that they investigate all of those and now they have that, um, I, that was one of the links. And the other one is the um, the COPE, uh, which is actually a, a international sort of uh, standard for ethics and professionals, of which now the ACM has their own uh, committee. Um, and that is, if you, for instance, see anybody violating the ACM code of conduct, which includes discriminating uh, against other professionals in your community, um, the ethics and professional conduct conduct complaint system um, is for that. And that's where uh, you can name anybody, uh, you can sort of bring together a bunch of people um, uh, in that form and say, you know, these are all the names who have seen and witnessed um, this violation of the ACM uh, code of conduct. The other thing that I had learned along the way uh, in, in better understanding this is that the IEEE, who, you know, we have a lot of relationships with as well, some of our conferences are co-sponsored, um, also has their own database. And so um, this is moving forward to sort of be uh, uh, larger than just the ECM, that there are more organizations who are aware that it is important to keep track of violations and to, um, to ensure that the community is um, appropriately upholding the policies that we think are important as a community. Did that answer that question? I might've gotten a little off base there. I have a lot so, in my head. <laughs> we'll make sure that these links are available. And oh, okay, thanks, Kesh. Um, so actually, that's really great because again, practically, how can I help someone? I see in a, in a position, if you aren't comfortable helping someone in the moment, there are ways to record, to document, to be acting as a witness. And 
honestly, having somebody come up to you and say, hey, that seemed intense, are you okay? Is a really great way to reach out and and try and be kind and share that um, you know, welcoming feeling because that that is allyship, you know? Interrupting a conversation that seemed really like one way and intense, maybe somebody was saying something that wasn't appropriate, taking that person being like, oh, actually I need to talk to you and then pulling them aside, that's allyship. And it can be hard and it, it can be very terrifying because that situation is one that you don't want to catch yourself in. But I really appreciate that, you know, the, that we've come far this year as a community. Um, for those of you who did not know, the first allyship event was in Kai 2019. Um, and I want to shout out to Kale and, and Kaylee here for their initiatives and their work. They couldn't be with us here today for this panel, but they did play a, a really significant role in pushing us forward and they continue to. And this year we have a code of conduct on the registration page. That was something I was really happy about. So shout outs to our general chair and our CHI 21 organizing committee for you know, putting up with that uh, request and helping that get done. And, and really, um, this year, we've really had this, this push to inclusion. We have now a, a way to report. We have Sikai Care starting up. And for me, that makes me really hopeful. Shawan, would you like to jump in from here? Yeah, I just want to build on what you said earlier, um, the point that the being attentive um, to um, those who are suffering. I also want to um, make a point that at the same time, I think those of us who are allies and care members also know where to stop. Um, obviously, we are involved with a lot of these initiatives because we um, are activists and we really, really want to do something good. But this is our agenda. This is not necessarily um, other people's agenda. And so I think we need to be there for them, but we also need to respect their decision. You know, when they feel comfortable, when they feel ready, when they are ready to take actions, we will be there for them. But before that, we need to respect what they want to do. I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate that a big part of Sick Eye Cares is also just being an ally, being there to listen if, if you are having an issue. Um, I want to ask a few more questions before we run out of time. And I promised Michael a very hard question. So here it comes, Michael. Um, what does it mean if you are an ally or an activist? Can you be an ally, but not be neutral politically? Like what if you have an opinion um, you only support like some of the allyship initiatives that are being put forward. Like, can you be um, a person who doesn't agree with, um, you know, or like inclusion into a group, or maybe you're a trans exclusive person, can you still be an ally? How does that work? Do you have to agree with all these issues? You promised me the hard question and then you added the second hard question on the list. So now I'm in deep trouble. Um, worry, I would like to begin by saying um, not doing the work has got us to where we are now, has got us to worrying that our friends are going to die in a pool of blood or with someone's knee on their neck. And, and that's just in the United States, globally worrying about so many of our family members in India. So not doing something is actually a, a political position. And um, and I, from my point of view, the time for that kind of, well, well-meaning passivity, that's the nicest thing I can say, is kind of over. We know what happens. We'll have more of what's going on. And, and what's going on is not good. That's Michael's opinion. Um, so, so I guess that's a beginning point. And then I guess I would say, and this is where I'm going to get in trouble. Um, I, I, I opened a web page for this so that I would quote Dr. King correctly. Um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. So the arc of Michael is not as long as the moral universe, but the arc of Michael is kind of long and I'm still bending toward justice and I'm still trying to get there. And I hope that's true for all of us. And so I'm thinking, if you don't agree with something, if you're not comfortable with something, if you think something isn't important enough yet, and you know, I've got my list of things that I'm worried about that are not the cause of the moment. And um, I hope your arc is long and I hope your arc will bend toward justice too, and you'll do what you can. 
You'll do what you can. And if it isn't everything, well, sorry, none of us is doing everything anyway. So make a contribution where you can um, bend that arc of the moral universe in the direction we want. That I'm sorry, that wasn't a very complete thing to say, but. I liked it. I liked it. I was like, I really like that idea. And, and right now, especially with the things going on internationally, um, yeah, it can be really scary. You might, like, it's generally like um, a fear for people. And I know that sometimes people who are fortunate enough to be in a position where they, they aren't scared to walk down the street, um, you know, like they aren't scared to hold hands with a person they love in, in public, sometimes kind of end up taking these little things for granted. And sometimes being an ally is just being able to think outside of your box, think outside of your world and, and really have empathy. And I wanted to ask as well, I know the question is hard, but would anyone else like to talk about how political statements, I really like what Michael said as well as not taking a political statement is a political statement because you're fortunate enough not to have to fight the system. So just opening it up. I mean, we have this, this conversation all the time and, um, you know, I mean, I, I I could literally write a political statement every week for Sig Kai. There's always something going on, and then, you know, it becomes the situation of of oh, I, I didn't write one about this. Does that mean it's not important enough? One of the things that we we kind of have started to do is try to see how can we kind of rise above the the exact one situation and see a theme across um, various situations. How can we adjust things a little bit more higher level? that um, sort of encompass where we think we need to be going as a community. Um, I, I mean, that's just in order to, first of all, make this a, a, a role that I can actually do every week along with my full-time job. But, um, but also that doesn't become a thing where, um, I, especially with a leadership organization that we're just being seen as um, reacting to the, I mean, there are folks who would say in our community, oh, they're just reacting to the flavor of the week. They're just becoming activists. They're not really thinking about the health of the community. That's not the perspective that we want. We also don't want to seem exclusionary that we talk about one thing and we don't talk about another. That, and uh, for our global community, that's actually very, very important. Um, so, um, so I think it's very Im important to think about that level of, of what are you really trying to achieve in your various roles. Um, I do also, uh, going back to kind of what Michael was saying, so there, I see this every once in a while, the, the comment about, well, that's your interpretation of what happened and which interpretation is right and not every complaint is valid. And, and I, I have a tough time like answering and, and having those disagreements with folks and being like, well, you know, we have to listen to those that were harmed and you can't tell them that they didn't feel that harm. Like that's like the first starting point. Um, uh, and that, that is um, very hard for a lot of communities. So going back to the, um, you know, like what if you're, you know, for one group and not another group, you know, and you think like, this is a good matter, but that's not a good matter. That, that does become a constant conversation you need to have with folks and be like, well, we do need to remember that um, even if you, might not understand, you can't invalidate their feelings. You can't invalidate folks' feelings. Um, so I find that that gets that conversation a little bit further out of the, well, I don't know how I feel about X. Um, the other challenge that I had um, is actually talking to those within um, marginalized groups to understand that there are many groups that, for instance, Big Kai, the Kai Conference organizers, is, et cetera, are trying to think about. And sometimes decisions have to be made that don't create an equitable situation. So um, we often have conversations, just to think of one that's always in the front of my head about weighing need for um, accessible locations with global movement of conferences. Um, and you know, those are things that we obviously value, um, but it, in, any given moment, you have to make a decision and sometimes the values end up not being the same. And that's not because I don't think one or the other is as important. You know, it's, it's, 
it's a weighing of them. And, and I think like that's also another um, challenge that it's not so much in that situation. I don't think, I don't believe in the complaints of a certain group, but rather, you know, um, we try to find other ways to fulfill the needs of the group that might not be on the face value of it, um, what would have been the ideal decision, if that makes sense. I hear you. Um, so the last 10 minutes of the panel, I want to ask every panelist this question, and I'm going to start with Rita just in case time uh, pressures make her need to go. Um, so really, everyone here that's been listening, thank you so much, and thank you for contributing questions. This one is probably the most important. What can we all do, walk away from this panel and do to make our community more inclusive? How can we all go out and be allies from here? So Rita, would you like to start? Um, for me, uh, I would say there are two main things I think everyone here can do. One of them is uh, learn to speak up, uh, not just for yourself, but for others. When it, whenever you feel that is necessary, there are so many people that cannot speak for themselves. Just, in, in, just like when Helena was talking about the complaint, I do appreciate the processes there, but some people will need the extra nudge to actually get that started like having someone say oh this is not really right maybe we can see whether there's a way it can be addressed it might not be involved but speaking up might actually help the next person and that involved is going to help our, us as a community to move forward the second point is a uh, uh, yeah there are many diversity there are many minorities within Sikai. uh knowing that you are not alone it's very important, even as a minority, there are other people that need help, maybe more than you do. So in trying to come up with a solution, have that in mind and uh, be kind to one another. I, I would always uh, want to highlight that based on my experience, everybody is good. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it might end up living its lives thinking that it is stupid or useless. So let's appreciate the diversity of strengths, the diversity of opportunities, the diversity of skills and potentials that we wield as a community and appreciate each and every one of them. None of us is more important than all of us. So uh, that would be it for me. Let's learn to speak up, appreciate the differences, the diversity in our, in us as a group and try to amplify each of our strengths and we'll get better as a community. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, would you like to go next? Actually, I wouldn't. I think what we, what we non-minoritized people need to do is a whole lot of listening to people who are not like us. And I want to exemplify that at the moment by not going next and listening. Thank you. That's really about action. I love that. Um, Shawen, would you like to? What can one people, what can people do? What is that one thing that people can do for me? Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Michael, um, for giving away your slot um, for now. Um, so um, anyway, I, I think that's a couple of things. Um, this is something that I do. Um, on the individual level, I, I think um, without those um, racially problematic events that we see at least in the US, um, I, I think I uh, routinely um, check in with um, several people, uh, like in a, they may be, you know, people of color. They may also just be people who are, you know, junior um, or early um, career scholars that I know probably um, every so often need, um, you know, check in, in. And this is going beyond just my in the, my uh, in institution. And also just some people that, that I feel like there's a certain trust there and and they are um, especially as time goes by they are more likely to um, 
you know, speak up. And I think this kind of regular check-in might be helpful. The other thing, and um, which I get um, a lot of inspiration from uh, people like Helena and uh, Michael here, is that when we have power uh, within our means, we really need to be a, a, a strong advocate. And that means that, you know, speaking up in a, in a, in a good way, we're not trying to be confrontational, but in a way that, the, um, you know, these kind of um, perspectives can be heard. And once this is being heard and try to find in a collective way, how we go from here to there. And I think every single one of us can do this. And because, you know, we are within our rank, within our career stage, there's always something that we can do. We just need to really do it, but do it in a collective way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vinoba, would you like to? Yeah. Um... Thank you, Michael, for what you did. So I think echoing a lot of what others have said is uh, to listen, continuously learn, and empower people by sharing your knowledge. So at one point in your life, you will become the privileged. Um, I mean, you're already privileged just by being at Kai. Uh, you probably have a degree. You probably have a couple of degrees. Uh, you'll get a good job. Um, you're already on your way to being quite privileged. And so use that privilege to sort of have open communications, continuously learn, don't hide behind traditions, try and work within the rules, but also try and change the policies for better um, and simply empower people who might learn and sort of continue climbing after you. I really like that. That's really a really great way to put it. Continuously learn and empower people with your knowledge. Elena? I, I can't really add more than what everybody says, but I'll do a plug for Rena's uh, curated YouTube list. I loved it. It was amazing. And I just think, you know, even if you think you know it all, just watch it. Because um, I think we're always continuing to learn and um, listen. And then um, each one of us have privilege in some way, shape or form. So in whatever that is, um, sit with the discomfort and be open to that learning opportunity. Um, I know it's not easy. I've had many discomforts <laughs> over the past few years, but I feel like I've always learned more and um, continue to, to work towards um, helping our community. So it's okay. And I think that's that's really great for plugging the YouTube created. Uh, this year, um, we were looking at ways of supporting the organizations that actually do this work instead of just going and researching and pulling resources. Um, and I think that the way of acknowledging these organizations by curating the playlist helps us really, you know, give a sense of where this is coming from, who are the people that we can go to for more information. So I really encourage people that, you know, you're welcome to uh, suggest stuff as well if you feel like there's something that isn't covered. And and please watch it. Yeah, you're always learning and always growing. And I also want to highlight something that Helena said that we didn't really get a chance to touch on too much, but this idea of privilege, that everyone can find privilege in some way. And, and already being here is, is privilege. Right. Um, and I say, you know, yeah, getting a chance to do my education, one of the first people in my family to uh, be able to do this is a privilege. And even though I might not be able to claim privilege in like all the areas, like I'm not a older white gentleman, um, like I do still have privilege that I can claim. For example, um, I am LGBT community, but oftentimes people don't don't immediately apply that tag. And that in a way is privilege, even though it's a minority community, just being able to, to pass as straight is privilege. And really when we look at ourselves and we look internally, we can find ways that we can support communities. I really like all of the things people have, have just said here. So I wrote them down and I'm gonna do a quick recap. Uh, learn to speak out. Rita, you're not alone as well from Rita. Appreciate the differences that make us stronger. Thank you, Rita. Uh, learn to listen and be a listener. Thank you, Michael, for not only saying it, but exemplifying it. Routinely check in with people. Shawan, 
great idea. When we have power, we need to be a strong advocate, Shawan as well. And, and also looking at listening and continuously learning to empower people with knowledge, Finova. I really like that quote. And don't hide behind traditions, Finova. And from Helena, we are always continuing to learn and sit with the discomfort and be open. And she tells us it's not easy. And I really appreciate that. It's not easy to be an ally, but it can make all the world of difference to somebody. Um, so we've hit 12.30 and I know that people are gonna go shuffle out to other sessions. I hope that everyone's having a happy Kai and thank you again. So uh, Michael M uh, Mueller, Rita Oji, Shawan Barzal, Vinoba Vinamorthy, and Helen Mentez. Thank you so much for being on the panel and thank you for Brooke Daly from Executive Events for really helping us get through some of the scheduling and time zone. And I really appreciate all the people who came and watched the panel and who will watch the panel. Let's keep this conversation going on Twitter. Hi, um, 2021 is our hashtag, equity for all, allyship. And of course, the question form, the Google form will be staying open for questions and um, panelists are gonna be around the conference. So if we were in person, I would see say, if you have a question for them, go grab them and buy them a beer. But uh, instead, let's all explore the Kai corridor digitally. So thank you again. I thank you very you much, Irina, for very making nice this Irina. possible. Thank you. And I'm sorry I was late for the uh, complete this session. Sorry. Thank you, for thank you audience. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank, thank you, everyone, you. for being well, here. Well, everybody who is here today, thank you. Great. Um, so I'm going to close this session. And yeah, hopefully we have everything we need from the chat. And good stuff.